On this episode, we're continuing on with Timeline Week and covering different genres. Today, we're going to talk about a sci-fi timeline, and we're going to cover <laughs> Lawnmower Man. What, what was that? What was that? We're gonna cover Stephen King's Lawnmower Man. They did it again. What? 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 What is that noise? Why can't I say? Why can't I say Stephen King? Oh, I, I, I can. I can say Stephen King. Okay. Can I say Lawnmower Man? Okay, I can say Lawnmower. Can I say Stephen King's Lawnmower Man? No, no. What is what is going on? I, I guess let's find out what this what's up with this timeline. I guess. The grass first needed tending in 1992 with the Lawnmower Man and starts with an experiment that it's said is funded by the shop, company responsible for the Firestarter and Mist experiments and a bunch of other Stephen King stories because this was based on a Stephen King tale, which I'll get into in a bit. They're putting an ape into really 90s looking VR and like, like I don't know if you remember Into the Mind's Eye, but this is like that. One of the test monkeys escapes since they've enhanced his intelligence and Thomas Crown is here, as well as the underrated Jeff Fahey. He's Job, who is a little on the slower side of things, and he finds the chimp, but the shop finds him and shoots him. Larry says that it's May 1st and Job works for a lawnmower company, which is why he's called the Lawnmower Man, and the shop is run by Hank. Larry flirts a bit with the mom next door, and I, I don't know who did the art for the fake comics here, but it, it's pretty solid. And the doc decides to carry on with his experiments on Job. It starts with games, then an injection, and then the VR, and Job keeps getting smarter and eventually straps him into this big machine here. Soon, he's ripped and hooking up with the near-dark vampire girl. But the more he studies, the colder he gets, and he starts having massive feedback loop headaches that allow him to read people's minds. The shop tampers with the programming, and he accidentally shuts down his new girlfriend's brain and can soon move objects with his mind. Larry quits, making him a target, and Job loses his humanity and starts to get revenge on those he thinks wronged him. He kills the priest who used to abuse him by doing this to him, whatever this is supposed to be, I do not know. Um, and then he goes after the bully and I guess digitally lawnmowers his brain. What is this supposed to represent? He then goes after the jerk neighbor with the actual lawnmower and this right here, this single scene is the only thing that resembles the original story. That was actually a short story about a man who hires a new mowing service that turns out to be a very large man who eats the grass naked and serves pan, and then the possessed mower kills the man. This movie was so removed from the material that Stephen King sued to have his name removed from the film and was successful. So Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man simply became The Lawnmower Man. Job's powers soon extend to mind control, leading to Larry's wife being killed, and Job says that by the year 2001, everyone will be hooked into a mainframe. So we're set sometime before that, and he intends to take over the world through the VR, and assaults the shop and wipes them out. And when I say wipes them out, I mean he turns them into boba. Job goes fully digital and Larry jumps in to confront him, having blocked off his access out and has set up bombs in the facility. But little Peter is there, so in a moment of clarity, Job releases Larry and everything goes boom. But Job seemingly escapes in time. We get a voiceover that says it's now July 10th, so this movie took place over the course of about two months or so, and all the phones start ringing around the world, so the threat continues. So without any visible date and only the hints that it's somewhere around the end of the millennium, I think that Real Time 92 is fair. That did well enough at the box office, and so four years later, in 1996, there was Lawnmower Man 2 Beyond Cyberscape, and we get a flashback to the end of the first movie, and a body is found in the building's rubble. 
It's Job, although he's some other form of computer ge 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 generated guy now, and they hook him up into this interface to communicate. Because of his burns, they had to do facial reconstruction explaining the recasting, but it doesn't explain how his body was even there after it was absorbed into the VR land. It also seems to ignore the last scene of the original. He's hooked into something called the Chiron chip, leading to this scene that I swear was not meant to be comedic. We then bounced to the future and everything is different, including buildings and cars and subways. Then hold up, Peter is here and he doesn't look that much older than in the first movie. How future is this? Everyone jacks into cyberspace with, and, and I am not making this up, the help of a dog. I guess being in cyberspace is like you're actually there or something and Job meets with Peter. I think showing him the lawnmower for a second to prove who he is. Um, and he says the cyberscape is dying and he needs help. And Peter is all happy to see him and everything is cool, even though, oh yeah, Job killed his dad. If you're a fan of Shocker, you'll be shocked, uh, sorry, uh, to know that this is Allison in her final film role. And Peter goes looking for the man Job sent him for, Dr. Trace, who's hiding out at Vasquez Rocks. We find out Peter's mom has died and Trace helps Peter and Job talks to him and he's now a wisecracker and basically a completely different character. He's still a little touchy though and tries to hit them with a the train. A computer tells us that we're on January 24th, but no year. And seriously, who puts the date like that without putting the year there? Come on, are you purposefully dicking with me here? Joe is being coerced by Super Saver Rip Torn here, and seriously, look at this world that they live in. This is like five or six years max after the last one, and in the first film, they're driving old pickups and listening to CDs, but now, look at these cars. They manage to steal the chip, but it's a decoy, and they get ready to activate the chip, which makes people wave their hands in front of their face for some reason. Job goes online and becomes global, but they have 12 hours before it's complete, and he starts causing havoc everywhere, eventually killing the corporate guy. And I love when they keep going back to the crown scenes, um, and you can see the people that are duplicated because they only had a small group of people and then just had to repeat them all over in these different areas, like this guy in a white shirt and tie, this guy in an orange jacket, and this kid in a red tee with a logo on it. They have to try to recover the chip, but it ends up being pretty damn easy to get to with Trace and Peter entering cyberspace to fight Job, and they make him overload himself. He regresses back to his original state, and here's the thing, they never say how long it's been, but the age of Peter kind of restricts it. The promotional material for the movie say it's six years later and he's 16 now, which seems pretty impossible. There's no way society changes this much within six years. Every single thing about the world these characters live in is different. And there's no way that much change is happening in that short of a time. So here's what I'm going with. This is six years later. This is this universe's 1998. But you know the ending of the last movie where Job took over the world through cyberspace through those phone calls? Well, he succeeded. This entire film is in the VR. It's all part of the fake world that Job created. And this entire scenario is just the fantasy realm he's built for Peter to live out. That's literally the only way I can make sense of this. Oh, apparently Molly Shannon is in this film in one of her earliest roles, and it says that she's a homeless lady. And the only one that I can find is this one right here from the beginning of the film. So I guess uh, here, here she is. Fans of the original short story should know that even though neither of these films have the tiniest similarity to it, there is a version out there. You see, King used to sell the rights to some of his stories to students or young filmmakers for one dollar. They were called the one dollar babies. In 1987, a version of Lawnmower Man was made by a NYU student named James Gonis. 
It was actually written by Michael DeLuca, who would go on to much bigger things and is a pretty direct and faithful adaptation of the short. So there you have it. It is two movies with one of the most insane timelines that I have seen on this channel to date. It makes zero sense. Uh, the second movie makes very little sense. It is wacky. Um, overall, yeah, the first movie is uh, fine. It, it, it's okay for what it is. It's fairly generic. It's okay. Not a bad movie. Not a good one either. Entertaining. Second one is just gonzo crazy silly to watch uh, i had i had fun watching it it was very weird um but yeah they're all right either one of these you'll have a good time watching if if you've seen either of the lawnmower man movies uh let me know down below in the comments uh, if you want to see more lawnmower man movies uh, tell me what you would have liked to have seen it become after this since it was only a mini timeline um and yeah uh it was weird but uh, hit like on the on the on this video if you enjoyed it Hit subscribe on the uh, on the channel if you enjoy what you see, and check out my Patreon page if you want to by going to patreoncom movietimelines and help support this channel and get more videos made. I would appreciate it. In the meantime, I'll see you very very shortly for another great video. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye bye.